existing. All right, good morning, church, church family. I'm so glad to see you this morning on the first Sunday in July. And it is a warm, muggy Sunday, but we are glad that you're here this morning in a nice, cool place to meet with the Lord. Worship. What is it? It's meeting with God. Worship is meeting with God and experiencing his presence. So we've done the first part. We've met together. And I hope we're, our purpose is to meet with him, our God, and that we will truly experience his presence, maybe even in an unexpected way this morning. Okay? Let's pray this morning that God will do something that we don't expect. Okay? Make that your prayer this morning. Okay, we're going to start the service with a song, though. Okay? Are you ready for our opening song? It's a praise and worship song. Let's stand up. And give God the praise as we sing. This is the day. Today is the day. The Lord has made. And what are we going to do? We're going to rejoice and be glad. And that's right. That's scripture. Okay, let's all sing it together. One, two, three, four. That's good singing. I always ask that question. When you woke up this morning, did you say, good morning, Lord, or did you say, good Lord, this morning? Which one did you say? 
Uh, perspective is everything. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, even if it's a difficult day, even if it's a day filled with challenges, even if it's a day where there are a lot of storm clouds uh, in your life to say, I'm just going to rejoice in the Lord today. I'm going to make today a day of worship and a day of praise. I'm going to praise him right through the storm and trust him to deliver me. And he always delivers us uh, from every storm, whether he does it in this lifetime or in the lifetime to come. So it is a great day, and I'm so glad that you are here. It is good to be back. We are uh, back from a week of vacation. We thank you for affording that to us. Uh, I've already thank you so much. I've already had comments from uh, the usual characters. Is that a spray tan? I've had been asked that, and you know, whatever, and so uh, take it down the next time you go, turn it down a notch or whatever. I've heard all the comments, but we got a little scorched while we were down there, but uh, we just had a wonderful time. I think I have a picture of my family. There's uh, us on the beach, the, and then there's our family on the beach. They'll let anybody on those public beaches down there. Do you know that? We've got a uh, Ole Miss Rebels in there. We've got an LSU Tiger. Uh, we've got a Tennessee Volunteer. And much to my dismay, over on the right side, there's even an Arkansas Razorback thrown in uh, just to keep us modest, I guess. <laughs> so, but thank you so much for affording us that opportunity. It gets harder and harder to say goodbye to those grandbabies. That's the hardest part. Uh, was on Friday when we, and they cried, or well, one of them did, and so uh, when we got in the car to leave, just don't look back, just keep looking forward, but thank you for that opportunity. Uh, we worshiped last Sunday at First Baptist Church in Fort Walton Beach, and again, got to hear Charles Billingsley, uh, if you know Charles Billingsley, and uh, we heard him at the Southern Baptist Convention, and we got to hear him again last week at First Baptist Church in Fort Walton Beach. But it's good to be home, and I'm glad that you are here. I know we have some people that the 4th of July has uh, moved all the way out into the weekend, and we have some people that are still out, that are still on vacation, and we're praying for them for uh, their safe return. Look forward to having them back. I'm glad you are here today. I welcome you to First Baptist Church. Let me say a special word of welcome to those who are worshiping with us on Facebook this morning. Uh, it has been really amazing. Last week we had just short of 700 people that worshiped either live or, or watched this part of the service or all of the service. Later in two weeks ago, we had over 2,000 uh, people on Facebook that worshiped with us or that watched the service later in the week. And we are just so glad that that is the case. Let me just share very quickly. This morning, I had a friend request from a surgeon in California. He's from this general area, uh, and uh, the surgeon had said, I have been following on Facebook, and he sent me a friend request. Uh, he said, I'm from that area, and I'm continuing to uh, follow and worship and so we we I, obviously I welcome him and we want to do that now let's welcome our Facebook worshipers we're glad that you're here and so uh, let me pray for us this morning and, and we'll continue Father thank you uh, for your love thank you for this uh, gathering today Father I thank you for uh Dr. Mikey Muburn, and thank you, Father, for his willingness to come and share in my absence. And Father God, bless his ministry as he teaches seminarians there at Mid America Seminary in Memphis. Thank you, Father God, for homecoming. Uh, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come back and just worship and to be here with a family of friends. God, I pray that uh, you'd forgive me of my shortcomings. I know there are many. And God, I pray that you would just help us to hear from you today, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother, lead us if you would. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. 
1 Corinthians 15, 28 says in that verse that God is all in all. I don't know what that means to you, but to me that says that pretty much that God is everything. <laughs> and if we know him truly by faith and see him through the eyes of faith and with spiritual eyes, we know that Jesus is everything. He's all in all to us that know and love him and serve him. The song we're going to sing is based on that concept, that precept found in God's word. And the, and the songwriter says it so beautifully that Jesus, you are my all in all. Lamb of God, worthy is your name. You are my all in all. You know the song. Let's stand up. Sing with me. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your My sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all.
song we've talked about how Jesus is our all in all and this song reminds us that what some of those things are Jesus is all in all he's all of our joy all of our joy we find in him all of our peace we find in him all of our contentment satisfaction we find in him so we praise him this morning and we find our peace and our joy in Jesus
When I look around and everything's crazy, you are still God, and that's never changing in the midst of my fear and my indecision. You are my focus, fixed in my vision. Amen. All God's people certainly said uh, Shabbat Shalom, uh, peace of the Sabbath, a Sabbath peace, uh, all the different ways in the Word of God in Hebrew or in Greek that God's peace is, is defined for us and described to us. And uh, I, some of you, when I correspond by email or text sometime, I say shalom. <laughs> I'll say shalom, which is how Hebrew people uh, a greeting and uh, a farewell. It is. It's just the word peace. God's peace be with you. That peace that the New Testament describes as being uh, beyond our ability to comprehend. A, a peace that passeth all understanding. And when I listen to songs like that, I think about uh, the story in the Bible where Peter in the book of Acts has been arrested and on the night before his beheading he was beheaded remember what he was doing he couldn't sleep he was tossing and turning and pacing anxiously around his jail cell remember right you should be shaking your head no remember what Peter was doing he was probably snoring he was asleep and God delivered him, and God sent an angel and said the angel had to 
smote him in the King James Version. It says he had to punch him to wake him up. Sort of like my wife does with me when I'm snoring. She says, you know, it takes a, a sharp elbow uh, to wake me up because Peter just had that peace that even if he died the next day, it's all good. That he had, he had a peace that just passes understanding. And oh, how we need it today, don't we? We really need it today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, Father, and thank you for your peace. And Lord, I just pray that you would clear our hearts and our minds and help us to hear from you, Father. Maybe if there's someone that doesn't like me, Father, maybe they don't like me. But God, I pray they would love you and that they would be willing to hear what you have to say to them through the simplicity of this preaching. Uh, Father, thank you for your word. Direct us now uh, to it, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bible, if you would, and open it to John chapter 8, the 8th chapter of the book of John. Uh, we're bringing to close this July the 4th weekend, if you would, even though July the 4th was on Thursday. Uh, some people are still celebrating July the 4th. There were some wonderful people uh, right outside our house last night about midnight shooting fireworks. Uh, I looked out the window and, and it was a, a bottle rocket war. Have you ever been in one of those? You saw them shooting rockets over here and then they would run and then the other team shot back at them. And I wanted to go out and say, can we have a time out here? <laughs> it's midnight. Pick it up in the morning or something. But uh, we need to be praying for our country. What we uh, have seen happen in our country over the last uh, weeks now, I guess, uh, I've not seen anything like it in my long time as a citizen of this this nation. Uh, I, I, I don't remember a time uh, when we realized that the media can't be trusted. I've known that for some time, and you probably have as well. Uh, that journalism died a long time ago in our country. Uh, there is no journalism anymore. Uh, gone are the days when somebody would say, Here, here's the news, you decide what to believe. Uh, and, and folks, that, that includes those of us on the right. <laughs> I hear a lot of right-wing media, and sometimes you want to say, okay, that doesn't seem factual, what you're saying. Uh, and so we have all these ills in our country, but we need to remember how blessed we are in our country. You know, we, we need to close our borders. I believe that. What, what, do, what do the borders attest to? People desperately want to come where? Here. <laughs> because with all the problems we have, uh, we have the freest nation on earth. That's not to say that we don't have a lot of crazy things happening in our country. Here are some observations about America. Are you ready? Only in America can pizza get to your house faster than an ambulance. <laughs> Only in America do drugstores make the sick walk all the way to the back of the store for their medicine while healthy people can buy suntan lotion up front. Only in America do people order a double cheeseburger, large order of fries, and a Diet Coke. How many? I've, I'm guilty of that. I've done that before. I like the, the flavor. Only in America do we leave cars worth thousands of dollars in the driveway and fill our garages with junk. Can you not get in your garage? You have to leave your car parked out. Only in America do we have voicemail, call waiting, caller ID, so we won't miss a call from someone that we didn't want to talk to in the first place. Here's a good one. Uh, somebody explain this. Only in America do we buy hot dogs in packages of 10 and buns in packages of 8. Why is that? Only in America do you find people circling the parking lot at a health club as they search for a close parking spot. Only in America do banks leave the doors to the vault open but chain the pins to the desk. Or how about these? How about these? 
Only in America can you say that you love your country while hating almost everyone in it. Only in America can scientific analysis be labeled as a conspiracy and government lies be labeled as the truth. But today, let's think about the good. We think about the bad enough. We hear about the bad, and uh, we should. But let's think about the good of our country. The second line of the Declaration of Independence says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this morning, I want us to think about what does the Bible say? How does the Bible define those three values, if you would? What does the Bible say about life, liberty, and happiness? And how does that differ than what the world tells us those, uh, the definition is of those words? The Lord Jesus is teaching in John chapter 8 in the temple. And he was being challenged and he's being questioned by the Pharisees and religious leaders of the day. And he makes this statement. Look in verse 31. That's not going to be on your screen. Look in verse 31 of John chapter 8. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then in verse 33, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and, and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Uh, they, were, they were arguing back that because they were Jews, they were uh, God's chosen people, that how could he say that they were not free, even though they were under Roman domination? We'll come back to that here in a moment. And Jesus tells them, here is freedom. As you pursue freedom, and everybody wants that freedom, as we think about freedom in our country, Jesus said, here is freedom. It only comes from me. It only comes from having a personal relationship with God Almighty through his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look there in verse 34. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is true freedom. On this July the 4th, we've passed it, but I didn't get to preach a patriotic message. <laughs> So we're, we're, we're thinking about the pursuit of freedom in, in our country and on a day and on a weekend with so many questions and so many uncertainties. Uh, let's think about those three values that are so important, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How does the Bible define them, and how does that differ, than the way, differ from the way that we define them? Well, we think about life. We know that God's word has quite a different definition of life than the world. What, what, how does the world define abundant life? Somebody was saying uh, about someone this morning, I heard, I always blesses my heart when I hear those testimonies about some of our youth that have graduated and gone off to college. I heard a wonderful testimony this morning about a young man that's walking with the Lord in college, and it just blesses my heart so much. And somebody said, he's living his best life. What's changed about him? Nothing socioeconomically, but he's just in stride with the Lord. And he's living his best life. That's abundant life. It is true abundance, and it only comes for, through a relationship with Jesus. Jesus begins there in verse 34. He says, I tell you the truth. The King James Version says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. There are two amens there. Literally, it says amen twice. Uh, Jesus always spoke the truth, but there were certain times when he said, Listen up. 
You really need to hear this. <laughs> he shouldn't have to. I, I don't have a Bible now, but I always like, do you have one of those Bibles that has the words of Jesus in red? Anybody raise your hand? You, does your Bible? I like those <laughs> because it's all inspired. It's all inerrant word of God. I heard somebody say, I'm trying to read through the Old Testament, but I get bogged down in all the begats and he begat this and then this and, and so much of the history and so much of the law code and then uh, in Chronicles when things are repeated. But it's all inspired, isn't it? It's all inspired. But to me, there's something about the words of Jesus that just your antenna goes up a little bit higher, right? You just think, man, when it's written in red, I want to hear and I want to read what Jesus is saying. And that's what he does here. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, and what does he say? In verse 34, he said, Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Some translations try to add an interpretation of this verse, and they say something like, Everyone who chooses a life of sin becomes a slave to sin. Sometimes, some translations have the truth, but it's what Jesus is saying here is beyond that. That's true, and everyone who chooses a life of sin becomes a slave to sin. That's a true statement, isn't it? Another translation says everyone who commits sins surrenders his freedom to that sin. I like that. And that's true, isn't it? But Jesus, I believe here, is saying something a little, a little even deeper than that. He said... I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And who sins? All of us. So it's not just saying the person who chooses to live a life of sin is a slave to sin. He's saying all of us once were. As Dr. Rogers used to say, I used to run, before I got saved, I ran to sin. Nothing has changed except now I run what? <laughs> From it. Paul tells us who has sinned in, Ro in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us. If anybody says, I'm so glad I'm not a sinner. You don't understand what the word means. Jesus says in verse 35 that a slave, even though possibly beloved and accepted, is not on the same footing as a son. The Greek says that the slave doesn't live in the house forever, but the son does. Slaves come and go, but the son is there forever. And you know what this reminded me of when I read this passage? And I worked on this two weeks ago. Anytime I go on vacation, when we get back on a Friday, I always think, i got to be ready for Sunday. Or I can't. Are you one of those kind of people, you got a chore to do, you can't really relax till you get your chore done? I've always had that. Uh, somebody said, you know, he's not afraid of work. Why? He can sleep right next to it or whatever. I'm not, if I've got something. So I, when I was preparing this, it made me think about, before we left, it made me think about uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Remember the story? I think I have a picture of that. Maybe gotten it too or late this morning. Remember the son came back. Remember he said, he told his dad, I want my money. And, and and the dad, can you imagine if your son came to you and said, I can't wait for you to die. I want my inheritance right now. You'd say, here it is. You want it from the right side or the left? <laughs> you know, you come to me and ask me something like that, man. Uh, but the dad gave him his, his inheritance. He went away, and what did he do? Everywhere he went, he made it rain. He squandered it quickly. And he started to starve, and he was feeding pigs, and he came to himself, and he said, I'm going to go home. And his dad was wealthy. He said, I'm going to ask my dad to make me a, a, a hired hand. And remember what the dad did? The Bible says the dad did what? Ran out to meet him. <laughs> There's a song, a contemporary Christian song entitled, The Day God Ran. The only place in the Bible where it says it's because Jesus is talking about God the Father. When, when you were coming home to God, you know he ran out and met you. And someday when I close my eyes in death, he's going to meet me and take me to heaven. But anyway, 
it says that the father ran out and the, and the son had this speech, this canned speech, Dad, I'm sorry, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me a... And before he could get out of his mouth, the dad said, Quick, quick! <laughs> to the servants, he said, he said, Bring... I'm going to get these out of, orders, but, or out of order, but it's for my purpose. He says, Bring some sandals for his feet. Slaves didn't own shoes. He's not going to be a servant. He's my son. Bring some sandals. Put some shoes on his feet. He said, bring the best robe and put on him. The robe uh, uh, signified who you were. Remember the color of purple in the Bible. Uh, remember what it represented. It represented royalty or those of the ruling class. He said, bring, bring a robe and put on him. And then he said, do what? Put... He said, put a ring on his finger. That clenched it. Because it was almost like a signet ring with your name on it. This indicated that he is the, the son of this wealthy, influential man, and he's home again. Uh, someday he would be king. Someday he would take his father's place of leadership at the city gate among the elders. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying we're all enslaved by sin, and only through Jesus do we find that freedom. Do we come home and become part of God's family once again after having rebelled against him? The New Testament states that not only are we enslaved to sin, but that we're lifeless when you're lost. And that's something I see more and more and more in the world in which we live. Paul said in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. Ephesians 2, 1, Paul said, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But in verses 4 and 5, he says in Ephesians chapter 2, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I'm come that they might have life and have it to the full. And the Greek word for life is the Greek word zoe. And we get the word zoology from it. A zoologist literally studies the science of life. You go to a zoo and you see live animals. Uh, it's the word for, it's the Greek word for life. And the message says in that in John 10, 10, I came so they can, I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. And so what does it mean? To be alive in Christ or dead in your sins. How does the world define life? Well, life is defined. You know, a lot of people say, uh, you ever heard somebody say, I feel like I'm half dead. I've gone to church with a lot of people who have been half dead for years and years. And, you know, they brighten up a room every time they leave it or whatever. You know, you, uh, and, and sometimes people... But how, does, how, does it, how do you define life? Sometimes you look at a person that's lost and they are vigorous and strong and healthy. And people that say, I work out and I do all these things and I, I stay uh, in the best shape that I am. And, and, and they say, I'm just filled with life. But you look sometime into their eyes and there's, there's nothing there. There's no relationship with Christ. So even though they may be in great physical health, they're lost, they're dead in their sins. Some people define life by money and possessions. You have a lot of things, you have a lot of stuff. Let me tell you, listen to this. And that's something that's never intimidated me. And I've had people try to lord that over me before, but that's fine. You know what happens to rich people? They get sick, just like we do. 
They have relationship trouble, just like we do. They get divorced, just like a lot of people do, unfortunately. They have rebellious children. They have rebellious teens, just like a lot of us have dealt with or dealing with. Uh, they have other relationship issues. I pastored a church once that was uh, in an area that was exploding with growth. And a lot of the people that were moving into the area were people of wealth. They were building really nice homes, a lot nicer than the people's homes that lived in that were that lived in, in the church that I was pastoring. And it was always funny when I would say, we need to go out and we need to start visiting. We need to have an outreach. We need to get out in the community. And people would say, well, I can't go to this person's house because have you seen the house they live in? I'd be, a, I'd be afraid to go up and ring the doorbell and knock on the door because of who they are. God doesn't care. There are only two types of people, the saved and the lost. And if they're lost, they need Jesus. If they're saved, they need to be in church. We need to go see them. It's not measured by relationships. I like a couple weeks ago when Don Dent was here, when Brother Don was here, and he was preaching out of Matthew 24, and he was saying, listen, you know, you hear people talk about the end, end times, and one of the uh, factors that you can get ready for in the end of time, we're going to be hated more. And you're seeing that happen. Christian people are going to be hated and despised and ridiculed and rejected by society. And watch this. Everybody listen. One of those, if you don't get anything else, get this moment. Life is not necessarily even measured by an abundance of years, is it? I had a friend of mine that I went to Ole Miss with. And uh, he had cerebral palsy when he was a child. And when he walked, he walked all over the place <laughs> because of the way his body was hit by that disease. And it was always, I'd sometimes get tickled at him on the way to class because somebody would walk by him and they'd say, Hey, Mike. Hey. It took him a few seconds to process it. So I always thought the guy that said hi to him thinks he just snubbed him. Because the guy would speak to Mike and Mike would go, Hey. <laughs> After he passed him. Because he was slow. And his speech was slurred. And the doctors had told Mike's parents, Listen, you'll never take him home from the hospital. And he lived to be 35 years old. And his father said, never in my wildest dreams, he said, I've always been an Ole Miss fan. He said, I never dreamed God was going to give me a fanatical fan like my son Mike. He loved Ole Miss and everything about it. And they got him, he got a driver's license. How many of you drive? You ever driven a tractor or a piece of equipment that had that ball on the steering wheel? How many of you know what I'm talking about? He had a little old bitty car, had power steering, but because he was so slow, he had a ball on that steering wheel where he could turn it. I rode with him one time, <laughs> once, in Jackson, Mississippi traffic. That's where he lived. But that day came. After the doctor said, you're not going to live, you're not going to leave, you're, you're not taking him home from the hospital when he was born to him being 35 years old. And one day he just said, I don't feel good, and he just died right there. And people say, isn't it sad? And I say, he lived more in 35 years than people that lived to be 90 live. I've seen that happen so many times. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And Mike lived that abundant life. And I ask you today, do you have that? It's not measured in years. And also the Bible, defined, as it defines life, it, de it defines very quickly liberty, 
You know, a person can be walking in a big city. A person can be uh, in Times Square in Manhattan with all the craziness that's going on there, and they can be walking in the midst of that massive metropolitan city, or they can be hiking in uh, Yellowstone Park where there's nobody and just uh, you're out there and just free to do whatever and go in whichever direction. Or you can be in the Gulf of Mexico on a nice boat and you can be deep sea fishing and see all the open ocean and you can be a prisoner of sin. Or you can be behind bars in a penitentiary and be free. God defines that freedom in a very different way. Jesus said in John chapter 8, again, if the Son can make, if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed in John 8, 36. And the people said, we're, you know, what are you talking about? We are, we're free. The Romans gave the Jews a limited governance. They had a limited ability to govern themselves, but make no mistake about it, they were under Roman authority. In A.D. 70, they were going to say, we're revolting against Rome. And when they revolt, revolted against Rome, the Romans came in and leveled Jerusalem and took the people captive. Uh, what does liberty mean to us? Well, it's not, a, it's not a liberty to sin. I think sometimes people say, well, you know what? <laughs> I'm saved now. And the preacher said, I'm free. I'm, you know, Jesus said that. Jesus said, if you know me, you'll be free indeed. So I'm free. I can kind of do whatever I want to do now because I'm forgiven. That's not freedom. Paul said in Romans 6, 1 through 2, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We who are those who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Paul said in Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He says there, I like that word, tangled. Have you ever gotten tangled up in something? When I was little, my dad worked six days a week. And so I don't have a lot of fond memories of my dad spending very much time with me. Uh, he, you know, and when I get to heaven, he's probably, he will probably acknowledge that. You know, but he, he thought he was doing what he had to do. We had food on the table and roof over our heads. But every once in a while, my dad would take me fishing. And that's about the best thing. And uh, I, I, you would see him, and I knew he was tired. He just wanted to lay down and rest. And by the way, guys and and ladies, for that matter, you'll never look back. I've never I've never been in a hospital room with anybody who is facing something serious, who has looked at me and said, "I wish I had spent more time at work and less time with my family." I've never heard anybody say that. But I've heard them say the opposite. Oh, I wish I'd spent more time with my kids. I've said that. <laughs> wish I'd spent more time with my kids. But my dad would take us fishing. We had a fishing hole that kind of looked something like this. A Mississippi muddy pond is where my dad took us fishing. And I could not cast. I just couldn't do it. We had those cheap rod and reels, you know, the ones you press the button and you throw the thing out and then you let go of the button. It was really scientific, complicated. You know, we didn't have a fish finder or anything like that. Sonar, hey, there's fish. We didn't have any of that. We had these Zebco rod and reel specials that were 10 bucks or whatever. And in that pond, there were a lot of things that you couldn't see under the water. There were a lot of stumps and, and branches and things, whatever growing up there, weeds that would come up down, whatever grows in the water. And my dad knew that pond, and he could take that line, and he'd throw it and make it go wherever he wanted it to go exactly. Listen, if you ever see me and I have a sharp fish hook uh, on a, a rod and reel, move away for your own protection is all I could say to you. I just couldn't do it. I just... You know, thing goes over there. I throw it and it goes over there or whatever. 
And you know what would hang, happen with my line so much? I got it tangled again. And my dad would have to cut that line and put a new sinker on it and a hook and a cork and, and bait on it again. He was not a happy camper most of the time. Uh, I just couldn't. I kept casting out into dangerous area, and I'd get tangled. The line would get tangled. And there are so many Christians today that think, listen, I can cast out wherever I want to cast out in my life, and nothing's going to happen because I'm saved, I'm free, I have that liberty. And that's not liberty in Christ. That's allowing yourself to be entangled in sin. Uh, and liberty for a lost person is not freedom at all. For we too were foolish, disobedient, Paul said in Titus 3, 3. For we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And our world continues to grow in that way. I have a picture here. When I was in the Tennessee Baptist Convention, I wish I could go back and find this video. Everybody still with me this morning? I wish I could go back and find this video because there was a lady that gave her testimony at the Tennessee Baptist Convention one year, and I think it was when we were in Sevierville. And that, I don't know if you can see that, it's a little blurry. That's the Deborah K. Johnson Rehabilitation Center in Nashville. It was formerly called the Tennessee Prison for Women. And this little elderly white lady, <laughs> and I mean, she was snow white. Can I say this? She was a cracker. Some of you know what that means. Some of you think, did he just say something good about her or bad? Is that good or bad? I don't know. She went into this. God laid it upon her heart. She lived close by to this women's prison. And one day she said, God said, you need to go into that prison. And she said, I just started going in that prison, and I'd meet some of the women that were in prison. There was a ladies' prison. Anyway, long story short, she had a video. And in this video, she walked into this room, this little frail-looking, white-haired, uh, elderly white lady into a room of about 30 young African-American women. And when they saw her coming, they jumped up and ran to her and hugged her, and they called her mom. And she said, these are like my daughters. And she had led every one of them to Christ and would go back and do Bible studies with them and take them goodies. And I listen, I wish you could see that if I could go back and find it. I have never seen anybody whose countenance if you could see the look on those young African-American ladies' faces, their countenance. Oh, they were free. They were behind bars in that prison, but they were free because they had found Jesus through the love of this dear lady. And I close with this. We know, we talked about happiness before, that pursuit of happiness Defined by the Word of God, it's not things, it's not, it's, it's not life circumstances, it's joy. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. One translation says this, it is a great and glorious joy which words cannot express. The King James Version says it's a joy unspeakable and what? And full of glory. <laughs> it's a joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I ask you today, do you have that in your life? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life comes through Jesus Christ. Liberty comes through Jesus Christ. And lasting joy comes only through Jesus Christ. I've gotten more and more interested in World War II. I've always been a Civil War amateur historian. 
because I guess one thing when you grow up and it's right over here and there's a battle right over here and there's things we live where it's easy to research. But my parents and that generation are leaving us now. That generation is leaving us very quickly, aren't they? I remember going to the World War II Museum in New Orleans. If you've not been to the World War II Museum in New Orleans, you need to schedule a visit there. Uh, I apologize in advance for New Orleans, but anyway, you need to go to that, you need to go to that muse museum. I'll never forget the first time I went there. Uh, there were lines to get in here, and there were lines to get in here, but there was a huge line, a long line. And in that line, there were some military people in their uniforms, and most of them civilians, families, whatever. There was a huge line, and at the front of that line, there was a wheelchair and a little frail man sitting there smiling at people and people coming up to thank him for his service. He was a World War II veteran. Not many of them around anymore. And those young servicemen that would come up to him and salute him. And on December, the, who remembers what happened on December 7th, 1941? Raise your hand. Okay. Milton was in his mid-40s back then. So he, and remember what, well, I think we have a picture of President Roosevelt. Remember he said December 7th, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. He said that when he was addressing a joint meeting of Congress. All the senators and the House of Representative members were there. And the President of the United States was asking Congress for a declaration of war on the Empire of Japan, who had attacked us the day before at Pearl Harbor. And he made an impassioned speech and was interrupted by applause several times. But one of the things that's omitted from that speech a lot these days when it's reenacted or even when it's courted, and you don't believe me, watch it if you see it being reenacted or courted sometime. The last part of that speech, the last sentence of that speech is this. Are you ready? Defiantly with confidence, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, quote, with confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable truth. Then there are four words that are often omitted. He said, so help us God. Close quote. Oh, how we need that in our country today. People that say, leaders that would say, God help us. We need your help, God. We need life, liberty, and we need joy. And it comes only by including him, not omitting him. Let's stand together and we'll pray. Father, we thank you so much for our nation. God, we ask for your help this morning as we come to a close of this July the 4th extended weekend. We thank you for our country. Father, thank you for our service, men and women. Thank you, Father, for our veterans. Thank you for those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms who died uh, Father God so that we could we could be free in our country but God we know that true freedom only comes through a relationship with Jesus true liberty true uh, true uh, life comes only through a relationship with Jesus and through liberty only comes uh, through Jesus only comes true freedom and liberty and father we know that we don't want happiness based on happenings. We want the joy of the Lord this morning that sustains us. Father, I pray if there's somebody here in this auditorium or, Father, somebody that's watching on Facebook, wherever they are, in California or New York State or Texas, wherever, Father God, I pray for those that are lost without Jesus, 
that today would be the day, as the choir sang earlier, today would be the day when they would ask Jesus into their heart. Father, just that simple prayer, Jesus, would you come into my heart and save me? And God, we know he is faithful to do just that. Maybe there's someone here in this room, in this building, that needs to come forward and pray. Come forward and let the pastor pray with them to accept Jesus as their Savior. Father God, speak to our hearts now. Help us to make a decision right now, Father God. We will be so glad we made someday when we stand before you in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing an invitation hymn, Brother Bob. Change my heart. Oh Change God. my heart, oh God. If, if God's spoken to you, you come as we sing. Thank you so much for being here this morning on this. Uh, first, again, as Bob was saying earlier, first Sunday. Where has the year gone? It is really gone, has that first Sunday in July. Uh, it's really hard to believe we are in, we will be in full revival preparation mode here now. From now until August the 4th, uh, Dr. Tommy Vinson is going to be coming back to share with us again. He was here last year. And uh, we're looking forward to a great week of revival, August the 4th through the 7th, or a great four days. And so you start praying about that now. Hey, we want to pray for Sean and our youth this week as they will be going to Centrifuge. How many do you have going? Okay. He's a, this man is confident of things this morning. I'm not sure. I don't know. Seven? I don't, if you ever ask somebody a question, they ask you the, for the answer. Seven? And so we're going to pray for them as they go to Centrifuge this week and be gone Monday through Friday. Uh, hey, the nominating committee, what time did we say we were meeting Tuesday afternoon? At 5, okay? And we're going to meet over in the office. Let me encourage you folks, if you've not let the nominating committee know your willingness to serve, we're going to be calling you. And we need people, especially on Wednesday night, to work. Now let me say this, you're going to hear me say this. If somebody would do prayer meeting, I'd go across the street and work. I don't know how that would work because I feel like as a pastor I need to be at prayer meeting, but that's fine with me. I can go across the street and work. I'd be glad to. I'd be thrilled to. So you pray about that, folks. We've got to have workers for Wednesday night. Do come back this Wednesday night. Uh, afternoon at 5, come, come on and eat. Let us know about your plans to eat with us before Tuesday at noon. But this Wednesday, everybody listen, uh, Kairos, some folks from Kairos, our prison ministry, that always uses our CAC, uh, they're going to be here and they're going to be telling us about how we can be involved in their ministry. And so we look forward to that. You need to come if you've been interested in that. Uh, it is something that... Uh, they always see a lot of the uh, inmates come to know the Lord every time they have their weekend that they usually have twice a year. And so this Wednesday night, uh, they're going to be here to share with us. And the next Sunday afternoon is Banana Art Day. 
uh, that's all the information I can give you about it. But uh, all the part that caught my attention was the homemade ice cream and banana split. So I said, whatever the art is, uh, we're going to be a part of it. It's going to be fun next Sunday afternoon. Brother Bob and Suzanne, there is no way that we can possibly thank you all for what you've done for this church. Mm -hmm. And they are, they're not going anywhere. They're going to be here and uh, loving the church as they've done and supporting us and, and right back at them. And Caleb will be here next week, and he's going to be leading us, and it's just going to be a great, great time in our church. Thank you, Brother Bob. Sing You're more than welcome. It has been an honor. It has been a privilege. It's been a blessing for me to serve for these last two years as your worship leader. And uh, I thank you very much for that privilege. It's been a, you have blessed me in ways you don't possibly understand. So I look forward to continue serving together. Really, may God be the glory for what he's doing in our church. Let's sing the Spirit song. We need the Holy Spirit's presence in our life to guide us, lead us as we go through these days. So this is our prayer as we leave. Sunday.